All right, everybody, welcome back to CS125. It's a beautiful day here in Champaign. Hope the weather is just as nice wherever you happen to be. So today we're gonna to continue our conversation about the internet that we started on Friday. On Friday, we focused primarily on the physical infrastructure that comprises the internet, the towers, the cables, the fiber optics, the undersea uh, cables, and, and all the investment that we put into this incredible physical infrastructure that we built up around us to support the internet as we know it, to support this massive communication network that allows billions of devices to potentially communicate with each other. So at this point in the story, what we've been able to do is we've been able to actually create the building blocks, the infrastructure that we need in order to allow essentially a connection to be established between any two devices on the planet. So as soon as you attach your phone to the internet, you now have the capability of communicating, sending signals to billions of other devices that are located on the internet. Um, now, how that actually works is the topic of today's conversation. So we'll talk a little bit about the protocols that have been established. And again, we'll go back and, and remind ourselves that this word protocol establishes exactly the kind of dance that goes on when two uh, devices want to communicate with each other on the internet. There is a set of steps that are established to prevent the entire system from just descending into chaos, right? We need some rules about who talks first and how they format their signals and stuff like that so that everybody else can participate and so that the uh, communication can move forward smoothly. All right, so um, in this GitHub repository, that's actually a couple of examples that we're going to come back to a little bit later today once we actually get to talking about the web. Um, but first of all, let's just kind of review a little bit from last time. So last time, again, we talked a lot about the Internet is wired infrastructure, um, all of the cables and, you know, the towers and the, the things that sometimes are hiding in plain sight, but are all around us that enable this incredible creation of, of technology. Right. Most of the Internet core infrastructure is wired. That's an incredibly important thing to understand. You guys have a unrepresentative experience of wireless because you're at the edge of the system. But the goal of the Internet on some level for a wireless device is to get that signal to something that has a wire as fast as possible. Because as soon as you can get onto a wired connection, the capacity is much higher, the speed is much higher, the loss rates are much lower. Right? So essentially, you know, if you're on Wi-Fi, your you know, signal goes to a Wi-Fi router and then hits a wire and then it's on a wire all the way probably to the server that you're communicating with. Um, same thing if you're on a mobile data network. You hit a tower nearby, that tower has you know, a wire or maybe like a really high speed wireless connection to some other tower. But the point is to put that signal onto a wire as quickly as we can. Most of those wires are glass, right? This incredible discovery, incredible invention, I you discovered it, right? But the invention of the process needed to make glass that is so clear that, you know, light signals can uh, be transmitted over long distances uh, with very, very little loss of signal, right? So, you know, the internet, even though, again, you see copper wires at the edge, the core is this, these incredibly slender, incredibly high capacity fiber optic cables that, that comprise the real backbone of the internet itself. Um, and again, this is one of the core enabling technologies, right? We talk about silicon, we talk about computers, uh, we talk about the hardware that's involved and, you know, electrical engineers have made incredible contributions that allow us computer scientists to toy with these incredible powerful machines. But when we talk about the internet, it's really this glass that's at the, the foundation of all of it, right? Just sort of an interesting story. Wireless infrastructure has been something that, again, is increasingly a part of your experience of the internet. But this is done at the edge. Right? It's the last hop. So all the different transfers, and we're going to talk about some of that process today, that are involved in moving data across the internet, typically only the, the last one, right? Uh, from you know, all the journey that that signal took to get to your device, that last hop is wireless, right? Um, but that's really, of course, you know, enabled the internet to propagate in ways that you know, nobody would have foreseen uh, you know, half a century ago, right? The ability of wireless internet. We actually have companies now that are talking about putting planes, right, up in the sky or even satellites to some degree, although the signal, it's tough to get a signal to a satellite, it's up pretty high, um, to provide internet access, right, to areas of the world where, you know, you don't have any of the infrastructure required to run the internet. So to some degree, our, our struggles in getting the internet to 100% of the the world's population or even past about 60% really come down to infrastructure. It's hard to get the internet to a place where you don't have electricity, for example, but there are people that are trying. 
Medium range wireless is these, uh, you know, the, the mobile data networks you guys use on, on your phones that you pay Verizon a lot of money for, right? And again, on some level, those are similar to Wi-Fi hotspots. They're just more powerful, a little bit longer range, and you don't buy one at Home Depot, right? You pay a company that has set them up all over the country for you to use. Now, the result of all this is that we've achieved this incredible connectivity. Once you bring a device onto the internet, the, all of those other devices, all that infrastructure has been brought into the service of allowing your device to communicate with any other device on the planet, right? Billions of devices that can potentially talk to each other. Um, but the question now is how do we communicate, right? So I can send a signal. So think about it this way. At this point, what we've allowed is that your device can send a message to any other device on the planet, but that message doesn't necessarily make any sense to that other device. If you just send it some random string of bits, there's no idea what to do with it. And so a lot of the rest of what we're gonna talk about when we talk about the internet and some of the things we'll talk about today and a little bit on Wednesday have to do with the protocols, the agreements that we've established among the communicating devices that comprise the internet about how we say things um, and what types of things happen in response. So a protocol consists of, you know, the steps needed to accomplish some result. Typically that involves a series of actions. So for example, when you request a web page from a web server, we'll talk a little bit about the, the web protocols later today. When you request that web page, you have to tell the server what you want. And so we need to agree on, on exactly how that message is going to look, and then the server is going to send you back some data that your web browser is going to use to draw the web page in front of you. But again, we need more agreements about the structure of that and everything. But we're actually going to start at the very bottom because what gave, you know, what one, the protocol that gets its name from the internet is actually much more flexible than that. This is something that's called IP. So IP, again, now we've talked about the internet as connectivity, the internet as infrastructure. We're talking about the internet as a protocol. This is the internet protocol. It's the protocol that takes its name from the system that it runs. Because this is on some level, the protocol that defines the internet. Internet traffic uses the internet protocol. Now there are other protocols on both that both use the internet protocol and there are other protocols that the internet protocol runs on top of. And if you go on and you take a class on networking, you'll learn about this whole model that has multiple layers and stuff like that, but whatever, we're gonna keep it simpler than that. Instead, what we're gonna say is the internet protocol is the base protocol that we use to move any type of data across this computer network that we refer to as the internet. The internet protocol is important in the sense that it does a couple of important things, but also it doesn't do a lot of important things. And the things that it doesn't do have turned out to be just as important as the things that it does do. But what does it do? And then we'll come back and talk about what it doesn't do and why those things are a good thing that it didn't try to do. So the internet protocol has been intentionally kept very simple. It answers pretty much two questions, okay? The first question is, what do we call each other? And again, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna use this analogy of the post office. So the post office is sort of like the internet in the sense that it moves information around between different parties, right? Well, one of the things that the post office has to be able to do is it has to have an agreement about what, how you address something. What is an address, right? If I write my home address, which I was about to say, but I'm not going to say on the live stream, if I write my home address, although you guys are welcome to send me fan mail, um, if I write my home address on an envelope, the post office has to have some way of knowing this is, that this corresponds to this house. So there is this whole very complicated database essentially that we've built up across this country that allows the post office to essentially convert the address that you put on an envelope to a location in physical space, right? The post person, post woman, post man, has to know exactly where to put that letter, right? So then think about it, the fact that this works at all is actually pretty incredible. You know, think about these apartment buildings in New York that might have, you know, a thousand apartments in a single building and you can write the name of one of them on an envelope and somehow that there is a specific spot on earth where that piece of mail is supposed to go and the post office knows how to get it, right? So that's the first thing that the internet protocol establishes is addresses, what we call each other. Addressing on the internet is very different than addressing done in the real world because what the internet addresses are devices, right? Devices move around from place to place and stuff like that. And so we use a different addressing scheme on the internet. 
right? But the way to think about it is not that different from our post office example. This exists so that when someone tries to send you a message, they can write where it needs to go and the internet can get it there, okay? There are two formats of addresses. We looked at this slightly last time. There was an older version of internet, the internet protocol called IP version four that used a particular type of address. Um, there was 32 bits, and that was just about the only thing that the internet creators got wrong. They didn't anticipate how popular this incredible network that they built would get. And so they only provisioned for about 4 billion internet addresses because each one is 32 bits. Now it turns out it's even worse than that because a lot of those aren't usable, and there's issues with how the addresses are allocated, but this is way beyond what we're gonna talk about today. But the point is, we don't have enough. And so what we're doing is we're slowly moving the internet from these older 32-bit addresses to a new addressing scene called IPv6 that uses 128-bit addresses. And once you go to 128 bits, you got addresses. You got plenty of them. You got more than you know what to do with. And this is a process that's starting to happen, right? It's actually been in progress for a long time. The rollout has been incredibly slow. This should illustrate how hard it is to change something about this system that's in use all over the world, right? I mean, literally, I remember being in graduate school and hearing about IPv6, right? And it was still about to happen. And it's still about to happen, but it actually is happening now. Particularly your phone, frequently. Some of the major carriers have been moving to IPv6 addresses. A lot of times if you're on campus now, uh, if you're ever on campus again, um, you know, when you pull an IP address from the campus network, you might look and see that it actually has this format down here, which is much less familiar to us, right? Those of us that have poked around with this, even in a limited capacity, are used to seeing these dotted decimal addresses that constitute IPv4 address. We're less used to seeing these uh, kind of crazy colon separated things that are uh, IPv6 addresses. But we'll get more used to it over time because this is what's coming, right? And this is gonna solve the scarcity problem of IPv6 addresses. The second thing that the internet protocol does is it establishes a certain structure for portions of the messages that we send to each other. And again, not a bad analogy with the postal service here, right? The postal service has instructions for how to address an item that you're trying to send, but it doesn't care what's in there. And it actually allows you to send all sorts of different shaped things, right? Like you can send a letter, you can send a box, you know, the idea is as long as you write the address on it properly, the post office will still move it for you. And to some degree, unless it's like hazardous or something, they don't care what's in there, right? All they care is you paid me, I'm gonna move this thing from point A to point B, right? Um, and IP, uh, and, and so this is sort of our review, right? And I'm sorry, I got excited about it, so I went on for too long, right? Um, in IP, what we do is we, we establish basically a header, which is very much like a, an address for an envelope that puts a, uh, some rules about a specific part of the message. The rest of the message is up to you. Again, it's like the inside of that envelope. You can put whatever you want. Now, I don't want to run out of time today. I probably will because I love talking about this stuff. But uh, I did want to sort of go back and talk a little bit about how data moves across the internet. Uh, because one of the things, you know, they've, they've done, I guess, some surveys of people and they asked them, like, what's your mental model of how the internet works, right? Uh, like, you know, when you are on Facebook, what's happening, right? And these aren't people that are particularly technology sophisticated. And so, you know, they say some interesting things. One of the common misconceptions seems to be that there's actually a single wire, like a single wire connecting you to Facebook's servers. Now, you might remember me saying something on Friday that that was actually the case, that if you wanted to, you could start with your device and you could follow that connection all the way along a wire to Facebook's servers. But here's the difference. That connection is being shared by millions of other devices and other connections. You're not the only person on that particular connection. Again, it's sort of like a highway. You get on the highway, there's a bunch of other cars, right? Like even if you could trace your route from one part of the United States to another along the highway, that's not to say there aren't any other cars there. They're using the same infrastructure. The internet's a little bit like that, right? these high-speed internet backbone links are being used concurrently by lots and lots and lots of different connections. Now, if you go back to the earliest days of the internet, this was this huge debate, okay? Essentially between the phone companies that represented these old established monopolies that were used to doing things a certain way and the new up and coming technologists who could see the future and could see a new way of doing things. So let me, and this is a, this is a fun bit of internet history. So let me stop here for a minute and sort of set the stage a little bit, okay? So this picture is here to illustrate a little bit about how exactly uh, the phone system used to work. 
Okay, so, so you know, and again, we've we've lost some of the connection with this, right? When I was growing up, you at least would see in movies where people would actually call the operator, right? They would be like, operator, could you give me the number for? You might see this now in an old movie, but it's really something that people don't do anymore. It's like Google it, right? Um, but in the past, you know, we had the sense that there was an actual human being called an operator that we could call on the phone who would help us connect. Now, at a certain point, all the operators were doing were giving us phone numbers, but. Earlier on in the phone system, the operators actually made the connection, right? This is an old phone switching board that you're looking at with the telephone operator sitting in front of it. What she's doing is she, you see that these, these uh, uh, connections in front of her, there's these wires and they, she's plugging them into different slots. So when you call someone, let's say you placed a call in your, in your hometown, you would pick up the phone and the first person you would talk to was always the operator. Okay, you didn't type a number, you basically pick up the phone, that would connect you to the operator, and you would say, I'd like to speak with so-and-so. The operator would know, particularly if it was a local connection, right? The operator would know exactly, so they would have like the, the connection for you, and their job would be, based on what you told them, plug it into another one of those, those holes in the, in, in the board, right? That constitutes the local pizza shop, or your neighbor, or whatever, whoever you wanted to talk to. And so there was literally, a direct connection, a single wire, it's like telephone, right? The operator is there to kind of connect things together, but now there's a single wire connecting you and the person you're speaking with. This is also where we get the notion of long distance, right? Because these short distance calls that only involved the operator doing one thing were a lot cheaper than a call that had to, trans that had to go across the entire country, which ended up using more complicated systems. But anyway, so this is the old notion of what's called a circuit switched network. If you know a little bit about electronics, essentially the idea is every time you place a call, there's a circuit established between you and the person you're talking to. And essentially means that's a single wire and what's being carried along that wire are, it's an analog signal. It's literally the, if you, if you peeked in there with an oscilloscope, what you would see is literally your voice waveform going by in analog form, okay? This was the system that the phone companies had built. And this is probably one of the earliest and most, you know, I find it really fun cases of technological disruption. We've seen how Netflix closed down Blockbuster and now Apple TV is trying to close down Netflix and stuff like that. We've seen this happen over and over again in the technology space. And I'm sure that this is going to continue to happen, particularly partly due to some of the changes that we're seeing where people have gone online recently, right? But this is one of the first cases. And so it's sort of fun, right? So imagine these old, you know, phone companies full of, you know, business executives, it's like the 50s, right? You know, everyone's got a, you know, suit and tie, probably pocket protectors and things like that. And these engineers were really good at building and maintaining these circuit switch networks. You had entire big, well-established companies that had, this is what they knew how to do, okay? Now, the internet comes along, right? So this is a totally different model, right? How are we gonna support this? One of the things that the internet was built upon was this idea called packets and this idea of building a network that was called packet switched. So instead of establishing a circuit between two devices that wanted to communicate on the internet, what the internet pioneers realized is that it'd be more efficient if instead what we did is we broke up our communication into small little bits. We call this a packet, a message, okay? When we want to communicate with another device, we take the message that we're trying to send, we break it up in these little packets, and then we send those packets out onto the internet. And once they're there, those packets are moved along the internet by these devices called routers. Um, each packet is packed up with that IP payload, a header that we looked at last time that makes sure the internet knows where it's going and where it came from. And then the internet does its best to try to make sure those packets get to the right place, okay? Um, this was a really dramatic and to the phone companies, very frightening departure from what they were used to. Um, and, you know, there's all these, and, and essentially would have required them to completely change all of their infrastructure. One of the things that's true about the internet, although it's uncommon, is that it's possible that if you are transmitting a da data from one device to another, some of the data may, trans may travel across one path across the internet, and some of the data may travel across a different path. Remember, we looked at that map of the internet. It's like taking two different routes across the highway, right? Let's say you have a big shipment that you want to get somewhere. It's too big for one truck. You put it in a bunch of trucks. They pay the drivers, they may take different routes across the United States. All that matters is they all get to the same place. Um, now, one of the, we talked about what the IP protocol does, but we also talked about one of the things that's special about it is what it doesn't do. And this is one of the surprising things for a lot of people. The IP protocol actually does not guarantee that your stuff's gonna get there, 
Okay? The IP protocol says, hey, you tell me where this is from and where it's going, and I'm going to do my best. But sometimes life happens, and not all your data gets from point A to point B. This is very different than the post office, which really tries hard to get everything where it's supposed to go. The internet, there's a bunch of conditions that can cause packets to be lost during transfer, and the internet protocol makes no attempt to correct for that. Now, when they developed it, there were some conversations about, hey, maybe we should do things differently and it should be reliable and stuff like that. It turned out to be a very good decision. Um, and I think we're gonna talk about that a little bit later, but reliability is not something that you need for every application. Reliability also would have made the internet protocol much, much more complicated, okay? Along the internet, at any place where th three or more connections come together, you have something that's called a router. Internet routers are this incredibly specialized device. It's essentially a computer, but it's a purpose-built computer. These cost hundreds of thousands of dollars for really high-end ones. And all they do all day long is move things from one of their connections to another. So imagine you have an internet router that has four connections, one, two, three, four. It gets a packet that comes in on one of its uh, connections and it has to make a decision about which one of the other ones to send it out along. This is how stuff gets uh, routed to its destination. So again, this is sort of like if you're driving, you make a choice to turn right at, a, at an intersection or turn left, right? These routers make this decision on behalf of the packets that they're looking at billions and billions of times per second. One of the reasons they're so expensive and so highly specialized is that's all they do, right? They're a, it's a single purpose, and the faster they work, the more likely it is that everything gets where it's trying to go. Um, now, again, when packet switching was proposed, these people were considered nuts by the phone companies. And the phone companies, uh, you know, I think part of it was just like, they didn't, you know, when you're so embedded, this is, you know, why Blockbuster struggled, right? They got so good at a certain model that when somebody came along and was like, oh, we're going to send DVDs out in the mail, they were like, huh? You know, it just, it's like, it almost doesn't even make sense. It's not like they didn't want to compete. They just almost couldn't understand it. They were so embedded in their own way of thinking. So the phone companies were so used to doing this uh, circuit switching that when packet switching started to become proposed, um, they were shocked. And they were, on some level, I think they were sort of like amused. They're like, ah, oh, that's a cute little idea, you know, that these researchers came up with it. Um, there's this famous... A uh, moment where some of the people that have been proposing packet switching, the phone companies got so annoyed by them, one of the phone companies, that they decided to set up like an entire conference. It was like a special symposium where their engineers were going to spend like all day explaining to these packet switching morons why they were so full of crap, right? Um, and basically the guys that were proposing packet switching came in and sat through all this. And at the end of the day, they're like, no, you're still wrong, right? We're right. It turned out they, they were right, right? Um, and so this is just going back to that map to show you like, you know, if I'm out here in Denver where there, it looks like there's a couple of, of big US mainline links that come together, there are routers in Denver that are essentially taking packets that, you know, just came west across Nebraska and trying to decide, okay, should I shoot that one up north towards Montana or should I keep it heading west or to Salt Lake City or should I route it down, down to New Mexico or whatever? You know, that's all they do all day long. All right. Um, now, again, to the, the, uh, just to point out the degree to which the packet switched people won, even voice communication today, right? So when you talk on your cell phone, on your mobile phone, remember, the original use of these networks was to transmit voice along a circuit that was established on a physical wire that carried an analog signal. Today, when you talk on your phone, more than likely or not, that signal is immediately digitized, it's converted into ones and zeros, into numbers that commuters can manipulate, broken up into packets, and sent across a packet switch network. So we're even using packet switching for some of the original uh, circuit switching applications like voice, right? That's how far we've gone. All right, one of the other, so, you know, might think, you know, why is it so important what the IP protocol didn't do? Part of that is because it allows things to build on top of it. So remember, IP protocol is sort of like the envelope. What you put inside that envelope is up to you. And what we've done over time is that the internet is now supporting lots and lots and lots of fascinating new services and applications and protocols that are built on top of IP. Some of these protocols you've heard of, some of them you haven't, right? Um, I also, this is also my, the point where I make sure that I push back on this idea that the internet is all about the web. The World Wide Web is one set of internet protocols, and it's something that's incredibly useful and important to us. It's a lot of what we do online, but it is not the only 
thing that is done online. Okay, so let's talk about some of these other protocols. HTTP, uh, this is the protocol that you've probably familiarized yourself with. Uh, this is associated with the World Wide Web. This is a protocol that we'll talk about a little bit more in just a minute. This is the hypertext transfer protocol. Um, but what about this guy, SMTP? Um, this, you know, again, normally I would have some awkward silence in class when people thought about it a little bit. I would give you some hints. You know, you might resent getting too much of blank. Um, you might have just written a blank to your friend about how terrible it is being stuck at home. Uh, you know, you might, uh, you know, send your professor a blank when you need some help, whatever. Um, email. Uh, this is a protocol, the simple mail transfer protocol that moves email across the web, uh, across the internet. Okay. This is not the web. It's not a web protocol, right? This is an internet protocol. So if we look at all the packets that are being moved along the internet, some of them have data that's going to end up in a web browser. Some of them have data that's going to end up in your email inbox. It's a protocol called DNS. Um, this is actually more of a service, but also involves a protocol. Um, this is what's used to translate names to numbers. So we talked about how the internet names things. The internet, like many computer systems, names things using numbers. But humans are not particularly good at that type of naming system, right? Phone numbers are about as the best we can do. Uh, but on the internet, you know, you don't go to 192.17.96.8. If you did, let's see if my browser will even uh, allow me to do that. Uh, 192.17.96.8. Um, okay, yeah, um, let's see here. Okay, so, um, yeah, it looks like that's an old, old, old address. Um, Chrome, Chrome uh, I, I discovered this recently, it, this is a totally off topic, but Chrome has this like great feature where when you get to that screen, there's actually no way, there's no confirmation dialogue for that screen. You can't click OK and get Chrome to do what you want. But it turns out if you type this is unsafe, no spaces, all lowercase, it'll just work. So that's kind of fun, right? It's like a little Easter egg built into Chrome. I think you could find out about this online, but I was kind of surprised that it worked. Um, all right, and, and the cool thing about IP is that anybody can build protocols on top of them. So if you have a particular protocol that you want to run over the internet, you know, the, the, again, go back to the analogy with the post office. Let's say you want to move some, you want to use the post office to do some sort of service. So on some level, Netflix, right, developed a, a service on top of the post office, right, where they were using the post office to move their data around. What was inside the envelope were always, you know, DVDs when Netflix got started, right? Um, but the internet gives you the power or anyone who wants to propose a new protocol to write a new protocol on top of this very simple internet protocol and begin to use that protocol across the internet. Now, it, it requires that there are two devices that are communicating with your protocol, two or more, uh, but this can be done, right? And there's quite a few more protocols that I haven't mentioned here that are used like BitTorrent, for example, right? BitTorrent is a file sharing protocol that, that runs across the internet. Um, so hopefully at this point, you know, I've convinced you that the web is not the internet. The, the World Wide Web is just one of many different services uh, that uses a specialized protocol that runs on the internet, right? The internet moves mail, the internet moves, you know, uh, raw data between two devices. There's all sorts of different types of traffic that's moving around on this incredible computer network every day, right? The web is one part of it. And again, an incredibly important part, but it's just one piece, okay. So now, again, on our journey toward beginning to talk about web APIs, so we've talked about the internet, uh, we've talked a little bit about multiple things it is, including as a communication network and infrastructure, and now as a protocol, but what is the World Wide Web, okay? Um, so the World Wide Web constitutes really a, a suite of different technologies. Um, one of the things that comprises the World Wide Web is something called a protocol. So the World Wide Web uses its own protocol, so it's called the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. And this protocol, again, a protocol establishes a, um, a system that allows two devices to communicate. The Hypertext Transfer Protocol establishes the protocol that allows your web browser to, re to request a document, a web page, from a web server. So there's a computer sitting there somewhere on the internet. 
uh, usually more than one. If you're talking about a big site like facebook.com, when you go to facebook.com, your browser sends a request using the hypertext transfer protocol, or when you go to cs125.cs in Illinois, you send, your browser sends a request using HTTP to the server. And it says, I want this document. And then the server is supposed to send back something, right? And we'll talk a little bit about what the server sends back in a minute, but that's part of the web, is this protocol for requesting documents and receiving those document contents. There's a couple of other parts to it too that we'll talk about in a minute. What, are the, what is the content of the documents that we get, um, that get transferred? A lot of times those are in a particular markup language that's called HTML. Hypertext trans, it's a hypertext markup language. We'll see some examples of each part of this in a minute where we go through uh, some examples of the, the different core web technologies. Um, the, the, the content that's delivered across the web really breaks into three parts. There's the actual semantic content of the page, uh, which uh, defines the page structure. Then there's instructions about how the page should look. And in the web model, these are separate from the content. So the web page might say, you know, there is a bullet with uh, the, the contents, a markup language, the high text markup language, and then the link, but it's the CSS that tells it what font to use, what uh, symbol should I use for the bullet itself, um, if this is marked as bold, how bold is the font, what font weight do I use, what color are the links, stuff like that, right? All of these styling decisions, right, that are, are aesthetic. And then finally, and this is actually one of the coolest things about the modern web, my, my favorite things, is that it's a programming platform, right? This is a development platform. When you go to a website, you know, you might think, oh, I'm downloading a web page. You're not. Most modern websites, what you're getting is a web application. You're not just getting content. You're actually getting computer code that is being sent to you from the website to your browser and then is run in your browser. Okay, so almost every website, not every website, but almost every website now uh, contains a small amount of computer code that is run when the website's loaded, okay? Um, so for example, our slides, okay? This is a pretty simple you know, set of documents that you're looking at, right? But every time you change the slide, there's a small little piece of JavaScript that tells our backend server, hey, this person is looking at this particular slide. That's how we do the participation track. Right, so that's an example of a tiny little program that came along with the page. On more complicated websites, like if you go to Google Docs, you get a huge blob of JavaScript. Right? This is a complex application. I'm essentially building, you know, you have different examples to this, but I'm building like a whole, um, a whole uh, uh, word processing application in the browser. And I can do that because of this programming language called JavaScript. Okay, let's talk a little bit about each one of those technologies in turn. So the, the protocol itself, the hypertext transfer protocol specifies, so like many protocols, right? One of the things that the HTTP does is it breaks the messages into different types. So it basically says, here's this restricted language that you can use to communicate between an HTTP client and an HTTP server. Uh, one of the things we agree on is what uh, different types of messages can we send to each other and what those messages are going to mean, what the semantics of those messages are going to mean. Now, HTTP actually has a bunch of different messages that it defines. I'm only going to talk about two of them because those two constitute probably the two most interesting. One, because it's most widespread, and the other because it gets used a lot of places um, to send data back to the uh, web server. In, on the web, most of the data flows from the server to you. You go to a web page, like you go to Facebook, Facebook sends you like all sorts of information that it uses to lay out your newsfeed, right? Um, then later, you know, you might hit like, okay? That's you sending a small piece of data back to Facebook, right? So we'll talk about both of those, uh, the protocols that enable both of those kinds of communication. Um, but every time you load a web page, it starts with a get request, okay? And usually uh, there's a bunch of other get requests that are then launched in order to finish loading the page. So uh, because I'm, you know, this is particularly easy to do because I'm online now. Okay, so let's have some fun. I'm gonna open up uh, move this to the bottom. So here's what I just did. Uh, if you if you go, if you're using Chrome, it's slightly different than using Safari or Firefox, but if you use Chrome, you right click and then there's this uh, option called inspect, right? I don't know if you can see this because I'm not sure you can actually see my cursor, 
But okay, but now you can see that I've opened up this, this console, right? And I don't know if some of you knew this was in there, but it turns out your web browser is, has a debugger, right? It basically, it's almost like now we've turned our web browser suddenly into Android Studio, right? Like you can actually write code in here. You can inspect what's going on. Um, so one of the things I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go over here to the network tab. And actually, let, let me open this up on a different tab where we're loading a slightly different website. Okay, so let's go to cs125.cs, open up the inspector, uh, go to the network tab. And now what, what you'll see is that um, there's no requests that have been recorded so far, but I'm gonna reload the page. And now we'll see what's gonna happen. Okay, so, uh, and what you'll see is there are all these, and let's see here. Um, okay, I'm looking at all of them. What I want to do, there's usually a way to get it to tell you um, header options method. Okay, here we go. So, um, so this is this will show you actually all the different uh, HTTP requests that your browser made in order to load the page. And so you'll see the first page is a get request. Okay. Um, and that succeeded. And then all of these get, 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 you can see that it took several different get requests to assemble the entire page. And that's because um, the first thing it loaded was one document and then it needed some images and stuff like that and fonts and all this other thing. But, but this is one of the primary workhorses on the web is a get request. It's a request from the client for the server to send it some data, some information, some resource. That data could be HTML, that data can be JavaScript, that data can be a style sheet, that data can be an image. Um, that data could be a font, all sorts of, of options there, okay? All right, so, and every time you go to a website, that's the primary workhorse that's being used at these get requests. Your client, your browser is making a bunch of them in order to get all of the data it needs to put the page together. Now, let's talk about forms. So when you submit a form online, you're actually using something called a post request. The get request is used to get data from the server to your web browser. A post request works the opposite way. A post request sends data from your uh, client to the web server. And think about both of those modalities on something that you might be familiar with. Let's say you're shopping online, right? You're browsing from page to page. Every time you go to a new page, it's a new get request. You're asking for the the server to say, hey, I want to know what's on the fourth page of shoes sorted by price descending or something like that. I don't know. Um, but when you put something into your cart, now you need to tell the server something. You need to tell the server, hey, I'm interested in potentially buying this pair of shoes. And so when you do something like add to cart, typically what that does is it sends a post request back to the server with some information from your client saying, hey, server, I would like to uh, put this particular, you know, shoe into my car. Um, so the other difference between these two is that get is not expected to change anything about the world, whereas post is supposed to change something about the world. So I should be able to repeat the same get request 10 times and, you know, nothing bad happens. But when I post something, sometimes, for example, if I'm posting, I want to add something to my cart, I don't want to repeat that five times because now I've got five copies of the same item in my cart. This is why you might still get that old warning. There's usually ways around this now, but you can still find it on some sites when you submit a form, like do not hit the back button because you might submit the form again and your credit card will be charged twice. This is why, because it's a post request that's used to submit the data that says, hey, Amazon, or hey, whatever web company, I wanna pay for this thing right now. Here's my credit card information. That's what you use a post for. So if you post that twice, the site, if it's dumb, might think, oh, well, the person really wanted to repeat the same order twice. And you might get two copies of it in the mail and have to pay for it twice. Okay. Um, and so again, I just kind of explained this, right? So Git doesn't change anything about the world. Post should change something about the world, right? A post request means that something gets saved. Like again, you liked something on Facebook. That's a small post request. Facebook is now saying, okay, well, I'm going to put down in my database that this person liked this, uh, this post, right? So then next time I show the post, the like count will be one higher. Okay. Now let's talk about, so, so again, these are like the two minute introduction to these various pieces of the web. It's sort of fun. Um, now let's talk about what's actually being moved around, right? So what's the data that we're getting from the server when we make a get request? That is typically something called HTML. HTML is content that defines how a web page is structured. 
Now, you guys have spent the semester working in Android Studio, and some of you have had a little bit of a chance, and I think you're having a chance now, as you can start with your final project, to work a little bit on layout. And you might have poked around a little bit and found a way that you can edit the layout using this uh, language called XML. HTML is not that different. Uh, what HTML says about the, a particular part of a page is, here's the content and here's some structural information about it. So I'm going to go through this with you just quickly, right? So here, for example, this is an HTML tag. It's enclosed between uh, triangle brackets. Um, this is an open tag and this is a closed tag. You'll see that it starts with a forward slash. Inside is some text content. And what this tag says, this tag in HTML is a, a header. It's a first level header. I also have second level headers, which are H2 all the way down to H6. Now think about how we structure content. A first level header is important, right? If you were putting it on the page, you might do something to draw attention to it, like make the font bigger and provide a little bit of white space around it, right? So that people can tell that it's a heading. Right here, this is another type of HTML tag. This is a P. It stands for paragraph. This is a paragraph of text. Again, here's my open tag and here's my close tag that starts with a forward slash. Same, uh, same uh, letter, just slightly different. What's inside of it, this basically tells your web browser this content on the page constitutes a paragraph. And again, I might want to do something with that paragraph. I might indent the beginning of the paragraph a little bit or I might you know, offset it with white space a little bit again on both sides. What about this? You know, you might, I might just pause here normally and ask you to guess what an OL is. Um, it's an ordered list. There's ordered lists and there's ULs, unordered lists. An ordered list has an order. So when you render it, when you show it to the user, you might use numbers to set off each item. These are list items. So this is the contents of the list. It says, okay, I'm opening up a list and then I have one, two, three list items. And then down here, I close the list. So this is an example of a tag that's nested inside another tag. And then finally here, here's another example of modifying content. So what this is, is it says the text in here is, should be given emphasis. It's strong, right? How is that typically, uh, how do you see that normally? With bold, right? Uh, page says, okay, well, you told me that that text was strong. I need to draw attention to it. I'm going to do that by putting it in bold face type, which causes it to look a little different than the text around, right? So here's an example. And by example, I mean, this is the exact content from the previous slide uh, rendered in my browser, right? So you'll see that H1 was rendered uh, larger. Um, my ordered list is has numbers. Here is the text that was bold. And I also used uh, an I tag here at the back. Uh-oh. I think sometimes this gets stuck if I do this. Um, yeah, I used an I tag at the end and that put that last bit in italics. All right. Um, I don't have a lot of time to talk about this. I think I rambled on a little bit too long today this morning telling stories about the internet, which is really fun. But, um, you know, but, but the, the, so the way that the content that is delivered to your browser has, uh, it has changed a lot over the, the years and, and particularly during my lifetime, right? Um, so there's a notion of what's called a static website, right? Meaning that when you make a request, the server always gives you the same page. And in fact, the contents of that page are sitting in a file on disk. The CS125 website is a static site. When you go to cs125.cs.illinois.edu, what the web server does is there's a file sitting there um, that has the contents and it picks up that file and sends it back to you, basically. Um, now, you know, one of the first things that happened on the internet is this idea that um, the contents might change for individual users. So if you go to amazon.com and I go to amazon.com, what we see on the front page is going to be totally different. The reason is what happens there is when you go to amazon.com, your browser sends off along some little pieces of information that particularly if you've used Amazon recently or, lo or, or logged in, allow Amazon to identify you. So Amazon just doesn't send the same page back to me and to you. Amazon says, okay, well, what has Jeffrey bought recently? What has, you know, Kathy bought recently? And sends us a page where their servers have crafted that page contents specifically for us, right? And of course, the goal here is to get us to buy more stuff, right? Uh, they think, well, if I put the right items on the front page, and they've done a ton of research into this, right? But if I just put the right items on the front page, maybe Jeffrey will buy something, 
the chances of you buying something will go up a little bit. Sometimes these algorithms get a little weird. I was pointing out last night, um, you know, as we were looking through some things to watch on, on YouTube with my wife, like for some reason, YouTube has decided that I should watch like a 40 minute clip of disc golf, okay? I have no interest in disc golf. I've never played disc golf. Um, I do kind of like Ultimate Frisbee sometimes, but I even haven't played that for a while. But that video has been in my list of recommended videos for like two weeks, okay? So like Amazon's algorithms are like totally convinced about this. They're like, Jeff, like I know you're gonna love it, right? Like just watch it. And it's also 40 minutes long. It's like, it seems like a, a big investment to make in disc golf, right? Just off the, off the bat. Maybe if it was like a five minute video about disc golf, I would have tried it. I am getting more and more curious though as I see it up there longer and longer. I'm like, huh, maybe they're right. Uh, but anyway, I haven't watched it yet. It's too long, man, 40 minutes of disc golf. Like how exciting can it be? Um, now, the last category of applications that's out there that's really starting to, you know, to, to, to be more common on the web is something called a web application. And, and these just totally uh, blow away the existing web par paradigm entirely, right? And I, I, I would need several class periods to explain kind of how these work. But the idea here is that the page that you see didn't really come from the server at all. Instead, what the server did is the server sent you an application that was capable of generating that page dynamic, right? This is something called a web application and it utilizes the ability of your browser to run JavaScript, which is something that we're gonna talk about in just a minute, right? So our grades page, for example, is an example of a web application. The CS125 help site that we just built is an example of that as well. Uh, and this is a much more modern, the, the course for my, the website for my course on Kotlin is an example. These are uh, much more modern and flexible and powerful ways of creating websites that kind of blur the distinction between a website and something that really starts to act like a, an independent web application. All right, so briefly, this isn't the most part of, interesting part of the web stack. Uh, along with your page, you also get some instructions typically about how the page should look. This is in a language called CSS. So for example, this bit of CSS says that the body of the page should use a sans serif font. That's a font that doesn't have those little uh, you know, sharp bits on the corners. Uh, and then it gives some specific information about how to style that H1 element, that first level heading. So if I apply that to, uh, so if we look at how this looked before, this is a serif font. You can see those little sharp bits at the, the corners of certain letters. And now I've applied this style sheet and now here's what my page looks like. So you'll see that the H1 has gotten a little bigger and the font used by my browser has been chosen from a group of fonts that don't have serifs, right? Okay. So last but not least, and this is sort of where I'll end today. Um, again, along with every web page, you get a small bit of something called JavaScript. JavaScript is a programming language. It is not Java. It has no relationship to Java. The names are super confusing. Uh, they were also invented almost exactly at the same time. These two languages really kind of like, um, and went on this really fascinating journey together. Some At some point, maybe it'll be me, maybe I'll get bored in quarantine. Someone's gonna write a book about this because it's super interesting, right? It's a great case study in how two different languages that started again within weeks of each other, right? Um, have evolved so differently had, you know, were designed around different, to meet different needs, but have really, I mean, Java and JavaScript are still two of usually the top three programming languages in use if you look at all these surveys, right? So they're both incredibly successful. JavaScript's a totally different language, nothing to do with Java. Uh, you can learn it, I would encourage you to, it's fun. It allows you to build really cool things. Um, but here's an example of a little bit of JavaScript that you could uh, send along with the page. Now, I'm not gonna stop and try to start teaching you JavaScript suddenly with like two weeks left in the semester. Um, but some of this may look like slightly familiar to you. You could maybe just, you know, squint at it and have some sense of what's going on. Um, but, and here's what this does. Ah, remember blinking text, right? Uh, back in the day, well, you probably don't actually, it's probably before your time. So, you know, um, the, one of the things that we've, one of the parts of this journey that we've been on together with the internet has been killing off really terrible web design. Uh, shutting down MySpace had like a huge impact on that. Like we managed to cluster a lot of it into one place and then we just, you know, get, you know, get, pull the cord, right? Um, but, you know, if you really wanted to still irritate people online, you could write a little piece of code like this and you could have your web page blank, 
right? And it turns out, just to sort of try to draw you in a little bit further, if you open up um, you know, the uh, console here in the web developer tools, you can play, you can do all sorts of cool things. You can say, uh, here's our hello world code in uh, JavaScript. And, and your browser will run this code. So again, you didn't realize that when you downloaded Chrome, you weren't just downloading a web browser that you can use to watch YouTube videos. You were also downloading basically kind of almost an IDE, right, for JavaScript, right? Um, it's, an, it's an incredibly powerful tool, right? A lot of people never get into these developer tools, and that's a shame, right? Because it's a really cool way to learn about what's going on on the internet. All right, can I get the blinking text to stop? No, I'm stuck with this forever. I'm just gonna have to stop here today. Um, nope. All right. Okay, so this is where we'll start on Wednesday, and I'll finally get to we'll finally get to talking about web APIs. Um, I have a you know just one announcement this week, which is about or today, which is about the quiz on Wednesday. So Wednesday's quiz uh, is kind of a weird mix where the multiple choice questions are on sorting, the programming questions are not on sorting. Okay, the programming questions will be kind of a mix of stuff that we've looked at uh, recently. The next quiz after that, we have some questions on sorting. Uh, some programming questions on sorting and then some multiple choice questions on other things. Um, one of the other things um, that you know I'm, I'm probably going to have to start doing over the next couple of quizzes is limiting access to the homework on Prairie Learn while you guys are taking the quiz. Um, and I'll just warn you about that beforehand, but some of the homework, I mean, there's only so many ways that we can ask you to solve some of these problems. Um, so, you know, some of the homework problems are very similar to some of the quiz questions at this point. And so we may find ways to kind of try to limit your access to that uh, or not. We'll, we'll, we'll see. All right. Um, I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, I know that, you know, there's like multiple stages of this thing and I don't know exactly which stage we're in right now, but um, there are more to come. So, um, you know, keep hanging in there. The weather, at least here, is starting to get really beautiful. It's spring, you know, don't miss it. It's a lot of beautiful things going on out in the world around you. Make sure that you get outside from time to time. Um, you know, one of the things I've realized is I've lost some of the rhythms of like moving around on campus and stuff like that. Um, and so I think like sometimes you gotta do something, like go for a little walk. It doesn't have to go, you don't have to go anywhere, right? Just go around the block. Right? Imagine, pretend that you're walking between classes and try to recreate some of those rhythms, particularly at this time of year where it's so nice out. All right, I will, uh, we'll be back here uh, Wednesday at 11. Good luck on the quiz at 10 a.m. Uh, we'll resume our conversation at that point. Uh, I look forward to seeing all of you uh, on Wednesday.